for today. And here we are. Hey, everyone on Zoom, can you hear me okay? Can I get a yes? Jarvis, Kevin? Okay, Kevin, yeah, you can hear me? Great, perfect. All right, I'm gonna mute my video, but just FYI, you guys are missing a bunch of awesome people here in lecture, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good idea. I haven't thought about that, but yeah, I can probably record like just me talking through the slides. Um, yeah, yeah, I let me add that to my to do list and I'll see if I can get to it. Okay. All right, guys, let's go. Uh, let's get started. So the very first thing, just FYI. All right, come on, let's come together. It's lecture time. Uh, I did grant an extension for the coding portion of homework four. Uh, it is now due today at midnight. And the main reason for that is, I kind of talk about it here. You guys can take a look. But basically, homework four was the first one where you. it's not enough to have just the correct answer. You need to have an algorithm that is fast enough. And my intention originally was for you to lose some points if you have an algorithm that's too slow but correct. But there was a bug in the auto grader where if any one of your tests timed out, it would time out all of the tests. So a lot of you saw like zero. It should be fixed now. So the score you have now is the correct score. Uh, but I decided to extend it a few days just because of that issue. All right. Cool. Um, all right. Yep, so that's homework four code. Here we are. All right, homework five is due on Wednesday at 11.59. Uh, this one has less written and more coding. So it's a little change from the other ones. Uh, I do have a Python version that is ready, but I haven't finished the auto grader. So I'll try to do that today, I guess. Okay. Hey. All right. So the other announcement uh, there is, so you guys get grades for coming to class and doing the homework. Uh, this is the version of my grade, I guess, for teaching you guys. Starting February 22nd, you will receive an anonymized survey uh, to ask you a few questions about how you feel about the course. Really, you guys have kind of been giving feedback on this already if you've been filling out the homework forms. Uh, it'll essentially ask you, you know, how likely are you to recommend this class to somebody else? And then how many hours are you spending uh, interview practicing because of this course? Uh, those are probably the two most important questions in that survey. And they're basically like based on these questions. That's how I get graded. Yeah. So FYI, grades don't go away. You always get grades, even at work. Every six months, I get grades. Even as a software engineer, every six months, I would get essentially a letter grade. Yeah, so Facebook has like meets most, meets all, exceeds, greatly exceeds, and redefines, which are basically letter grades. And every six months, you would get those. Google had the same thing. Um, so yeah, so that's for me. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, this one, uh, so to clarify, for this one through 10, nine and 10 are good, seven and eight are neutral, and actually anything below six is bad. So I just wanted to make sure you guys are aware of that. Uh, you can look it up. This, this score is used to calculate what is called the net promoter score. So you can click this link and you can read more about it. Again, you should be honest, but I just want to make sure you guys know, like, if, you know, like, I think some people, uh, yeah, just so you know, like, what's good, what's neutral, and what's bad. All right, cool. All right, so let's get started. So today we're going to cover depth first search. You guys excited about it? You have no idea. Yeah, okay. So we're finally done with hash tables. We're done with sorting, kind of. Uh, so we're going to start new data structure. All right, so by the end of lecture, the expectation is that you should be able to define what a directed and undirected graph is. Okay, so keep that in mind. You should be able to compare directed and undirected graphs. So like know the difference between them. You should be able to design a search algorithm on graphs. It's actually going to be depth first search. We're going to talk about it. 
Um, you should be able to understand and analyze that first search. So you will know the running time of that first search. And we will be able to write a working depth first search algorithm in pseudocode, okay? And also you should be able to use depth first search to solve real problems, okay? So it's not just a search algorithm on a graph. It is, it helps you solve like real world problems. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of them. All right, so these are the objectives. So by the end of the lecture, you should know how to do this, all right? Just keep that in mind. Cool. So from the end of last lecture, I actually introduced you guys to a bunch of different graphs. We talked about like species being connected to each other. Basically anything that has a relation between them, you can interpret that as a graph. These are some examples of questions you might want to answer about graphs. So in particular, this efficient routing, we actually use this in Google Maps. And I worked directly on that product where the roads in the entire world are actually considered graphs where you connect different locations to each other with edges. So in the back end, Google Maps has a graph representation of the locations in the world. And then you can imagine the edges tell you how long it takes you to get from one place to another. And one question you might want to figure out is if I start at this Starbucks and I want to go to NCAT, what is the fastest way that I can get there, right? So that's actually represented as a graph on Google Maps in the back end. And we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, yeah, but, and, and we're gonna cover some of these other examples. We will be doing graphs for the next several lectures. All right, so like all of next week and this week. Okay, uh, this is an undirected graph. This is a representation of an undirected graph. So an undirected graph has vertices and edges. So the vertices here are the one, two, three, four. So these are objects, entities. So for the Google Maps example, these would be like the Starbucks on First Main Street or whatever, right? The Googleplex campus, right? Those are the nodes. And then there's edges that connect two nodes, right? In our class, we're gonna say V, capital V is the set of vertices and capital E is the set of edges. And formally, we're gonna say a graph is given by the tuple of the, the vertices and the edges. So when you're writing it out mathematically, you would say a graph is defined by its vertices. So in this case, one, two, three, four, and its edges. For example, in this case, we would say, well, this graph is the set of vertices, one, two, three, four, and the edges connecting one to three, two to four, three to four and two to three, All right? So this is how you usually see graphs defined in research papers or like in math classes and in computer science papers, All right? Now, a couple of other like terminology to keep in mind as we talk about graphs, there is something called a degree. So the degree of a vertex, so you can imagine degree being a function that takes in the vertex, tells you how many edges connect to that vertex. So the degree of vertex four here is two because it has two edges, all right? That's, it's just definition. So when I say degree, I'm talking about how many edges connect to a particular vertex, okay? Um, you also have another term that we'll use a lot. We call it neighbors. So neighbors are gonna be the nodes that are one step away from you. So for vertex four, its neighbors are two and three because they are directly connected to four, okay? Any questions on the terminology? Cool. Now you also have directed graphs, okay? So undirected graphs, if you notice, the edges don't have a direction. So if I say four is connected to two, that also means two is connected to four. You can go both ways, right? For directed graphs, the edges can only go one way. So here, one is connected to three, but three is not immediately connected to one. It cannot go back. They're directed. They're like one-way streets, okay? So you can imagine in Google Maps, you actually use directed edges because you have one-way streets, okay? Um, but it's the same thing. A directed graph has vertices and edges. V is the set of vertices. E is the set of directed edges. For example, here, V would be one, two, three, four, as before. But now edges, instead of, so when you see the little curly, that means set, 
which means the order doesn't matter. Here, we use parentheses to indicate that the order matters, which means this edge is from one to three, okay? Whereas before, in the previous example, we had little curlies to indicate that, oh, there is an edge between one and three, but we don't care about the direction, okay? Again, this is just introducing syntax. And here's a couple of, again, definitions for graphs. So this is an extension, right? Last time we talked about degree, which is the number of edges. So in an undirected graph, you would talk about the degree of a vertex. For a directed graph, you can have the in degree and the out degree. So in degree is how many edges are coming into me and out degree is how many edges are going out. So for vertex four, you have two edges coming in. So it's in degree is two and it's out degree, the edges going out is one, okay? So what is the degree of vertex four? Yeah, I say, yeah, is, are you, no, where, oh, Vincent, three. Yeah, so there is a relationship where the in degree plus the out degree equals the degree, okay? All right, um, you also have this definition of incoming neighbors and outgoing neighbors. So hopefully those make sense as well, right? So the incoming ones are the neighbors where they can come to you in one step. The outgoing neighbors are the ones where you can go to them in one step, cool. So that's graphs, that's really all there is. That is what a graph is those two versions. Cool. Also, by the way, we do have a special guest. Uh, Isaiah, do you want to introduce your guest? This is my girlfriend, Bree. She's from California. Yeah. So Isaiah's girlfriend, Bree, from California. Uh, you guys are always welcome to bring in guests to this class. I love it when people are learning computer science. So bring them on. Okay. So uh, that's it. That's what a graph is. So you guys should know that. Yeah. Oh, we have another guest. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to introduce our Kennedy? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm studying architecture engineering here. Nice. So yeah, I okay. So we have an architecture and engineer here coming to learn about computer science, and uh, you take care of kids, right? Daycare, also learning computer science. And I'm telling you, this is easier than what you guys are doing. All right. So how do we represent graphs? So that's it, those are graphs. If you guys know that definition, that is the definition of graphs. It's vertices and edges. They can be directed or undirected, all right? So there's actually two ways that we represent graphs like in code. So we're talking about how we represent them in, in a computer. One of them is called an adjacency matrix. This is what that would look like. So again, your computer does not have, like you can't take this picture and be like, this is the graph, right? You have to think of a way to represent it, right? So this is how you would represent that graph on a computer using an adjacency matrix. Does somebody want to explain to me how this representation works? Yeah. Yep. That's perfectly right. So you can imagine in code, this might be a vector of vectors. So just some way to represent uh, a matrix of numbers. And then what we do is just like um, we were saying, a one represents that there's an edge between those vertices. So between vertex one, so the first row represents vertex one and the third column represents vertex three, right? So between one and three, there's an edge, one and three, right? And that's the same for the rest of them. Now you'll notice that in the adjacency matrix, if you have an undirected graph, what is, what, can somebody tell me what's special about this matrix? Yeah. What is it called? Okay, you don't need to know this, but it's called, the, the matrix is called symmetric because you can flip it over its diagonal. So like if you if you took like if you if you cut it here and then you like folded it over, the numbers would all match up. Why? Because for every 
you know, for every one three, because this is undirected, there must be a one in one three the other way, right? So the edges can, the notes can be swapped. Uh, that 12 being symmetric is actually a pretty interesting property. Uh, if you do more advanced computer science, it comes in handy. Okay. Um, you can have self loops, right? So what does this mean? We added a one here, which means one loops to itself. That's just like something you can have in your graph. Um, this is how you would represent directed graphs. So you can use the exact same logic, except now you interpret the columns, or sorry, the rows as the source of your edge. So this is where I'm coming from, and you interpret the columns as the destination where I'm going to. So in this case, node one, from one to three, there's an edge from one to three, but there is not one from three to one, right? So now this is zero. So now this matrix is not symmetric, All right? Cool. Yeah. That's how you know. It. No, uh, no, no, no. You're you're right. So if if the if your matrix is symmetric, you know the graph is undirected, which basically means for every outgoing edge, there's an incoming edge. So that's probably what you're saying. Um, if it's not symmetric, then it must be a directed graph because there is some edge that is like only in one direction, but not the other. Cool. So that's one option. You can represent matrices as, uh, you can represent graphs in computers as matrices, all right? The other option is called adjacency list. And this is actually what we're gonna be using in class. There's a lot of benefits to adjacency lists, okay? So the way an adjacency list works is again, this graph is represented by this. Somebody wanna explain to me how I represent that graph? Essentially, so what we do is we have a vector that represents our nodes. So this is node one, node two, node three, node four, right? So every index corresponds to a node in our graph. And then within each uh, you know, bucket or, or location in the vector, we have a linked list that tells us the neighbors of that node, right? So for node one, your neighbor is three. So we include three here. For node two, your neighbor is four and three. So we include four and three, right? For node three, your neighbors are one and four and two, right? So node three has two, one, has all of them as neighbors. So we include all of them. Now, this is not ordered, okay? But does that make sense? This is an alternative way to represent a graph in your computer. Yeah. Uh, Generally, it is not ordered, but you can imagine there are many, many ways to represent graphs. You can imagine an alternative or an improved version of this that maybe guarantees sorting or guarantees ordering in your notes. But for our purposes, we don't actually care. Um, but yeah, that's great because you're already thinking of like, hey, what are other ways I can represent this connectivity information, right? You can imagine like this doesn't have to be a linked list. Could that be a red black tree? And then it'll keep ordering for you, right? Cool. How would this be different for directed graphs? Um, yeah, so under so directed graphs don't have symmetry. So you are right that here, if you see here, like one has three as a neighbor and then three has one as a neighbor, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's one way. So the way you would modify it is instead, it's basically you keep the exact same thing, but let me see if I have, oh, I, I don't have an example. You keep the exact same thing, but you only include your out neighbors, for example. Right, or you only include your in neighbors. And actually, it is sometimes useful to know both. So what you normally do is you actually have two of these adjacency lists. You have one list that tells you the out neighbors, and you have another list that tells you the in neighbors. And that's actually what we're gonna use in class. 
Um, so if you look at the code examples, they are going to be using the adjacency list representation within neighbors and out neighbors. And for an undirected graph, we're just always going to add, you know, both the in and the out. Okay. Okay. In either case, uh, do note that in the slides and in the class, we're going to be using vertices that are just numbers, but obviously they can have other information. All right. For example, they can tell you the name, they can tell you an IP address, they can tell you the location of the Starbucks. So you can put other information in your vertex class, right? Your vertex structure, whatever that is. Um, another thing is you will often see a lot of problems can be solved with graph algorithms, okay? But you wanna store extra information in your nodes. For example, you might wanna store the color of the node, okay? You might wanna store how many steps it took you to get to the node. And we're actually gonna see some of those examples where we use the graph itself to store extra information to help us solve real problems, okay? So in the end, whoops, these are essentially the two operations that you want to do on a graph. For any graph algorithm wants to be able to do this. It wants to be able to check if an edge exists in my graph, and it wants to be able to say, who are all my neighbors? Those are the two things that most graph algorithms care about. So however you represent your graph, these two need to be fast, essentially. Okay? Does that make sense to people? So one of them is edge membership. Just asking, like, given a graph, does this edge exist? The other one is, given a graph and a vertex, who are all the neighbors of this vertex? Okay? So uh, what are the trade-offs of the two representations we just discussed? So you guys help me fill this out. What's the running time of doing these operations? Yeah, this is the we're the, we're gonna assume this is a vector vector, so a 2D array of matrix. This is going to be a vector of length lists, let's say, and they're not ordered. So let's walk through the first row. If I want to ask whether an edge is in my graph. How quickly can I do it here? Yeah. N squared. OK, that's one possibility. Can somebody do it faster? Yeah. Yeah, so do note, I know the edge. So I'm given the edge I'm looking for. And I want to ask, is there an edge between node 3 and 1? So this would actually be constant time because you can just immediately look it up. I give you the three and I give you the one and you say, is there a one there or not, right? Cool. What about for my uh, adjacency list? How quickly can I tell if the edge, if, is there an edge between three and one, let's say, how quickly can I tell? O of n ish, O of n is a good guess, actually, like really good. It can be O of n. Let's try to be a little more precise about it. How many, what's the worst case? So you're saying O of N because you're like, oh, if I wanna know if there's an edge between three and two, right? I have to like look through this whole list. What is the, what did we call this? What is this? Yeah. The neighbors? O of M, M is the number of edges. Uh, it will not be O of M, but you guys are actually right. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let's do the other. Let's do the other order. Okay. Forget about this one. We're going down this way. Let's say for this matrix, how do I give me? How do I get a list of all the neighbors of a particular node? So if I ask for all the neighbors of node three, how long does it take me to figure out who all the neighbors are? O of n, because you have to look at the entire row and find all the ones. Right? Perfect. Uh, how much space does this representation take? O of n squared, why? Right, so you basically have a matrix and the size of the matrix is n by n, right? So O of n squared. All right, going back to edge membership here. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw what was the answer, yeah? Or, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, if your list was sorted, it would be O of log n, but it is not sorted. However, we do know, I'll just give it to you guys, I guess. It is the degree, the degree of B. So basically, this is like how many neighbors do you have? It is true that this is also O of n, because you can have a graph where you have one node, and then it is neighbors to everyone, right? So it could be O of n. So you're not wrong, it is O of n. This is just slightly more precise, which is basically just like the running time is going to be, it's going to depend on how many neighbors my node has, all right? Because I can just look it up and then see through each neighbor. Oh, um, how about to give me a list of all the neighbors? How long does that take? If I want all the neighbors of V? Yeah. It depends on the degree of V. So it's O of the degree of V. Okay. How much space does it take me to store this list? O of N, very close. O of one, no, no, it's not O of one. It's a length, yeah, there's a length list. It's a little hard, but basically like how, how many of these am I gonna have? Yeah, back there. M plus N, yes, can you explain? Yeah, the N are the vertices and the M is the number of edges. Yeah, so O of N would be the space it takes to have this array because I have, I have one list for every node. So that's O of N. And then these lists, you're right, like they're linked lists, it's a little hard to tell, but actually there's one for every edge, right? Because it tells me who the neighbors are of every node. So it's O of N plus M, okay, cool. Uh, generally, this representation is much better, so you can look at it. It is much better if your number of edges is very small compared to the number of nodes. That's called a sparse graph. So a sparse graph is one where the number of edges is not too many compared to the number of nodes. You can imagine that a complete graph is one that has an edge between every single node. So how many edges do I have? If I have n nodes and I have an edge between every single node, so every every pair of nodes, how many edges would I have? n divided by two. n divided by two. So that would actually just give me n edges. So that would be one node connecting to half of the other nodes, right? Two n. Again, that would be if I have two nodes and each one is connected to all the other ones. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was it? N, N times M. Uh, so M is actually the number we're trying to calculate, right? So M is like the number of edges. So I'm saying in a complete graph, if I have N nodes, then the total number of edges is N squared. Because for each node, it is connected to all other N minus one nodes, right? And you have N of them. So complete means there's a connection between all of them, okay? so. That also tells you that M, the number of edges, can at most be N squared, right? Because then you get duplicate edges, right? Cool. Um, there is actually an implementation of this if you click this link in C++. So you guys can, if we have time, we'll check it out, but I'm not sure we're going to get time today. But um, how are you guys feeling about these two representations? Okay. We have N vertices, M edges. And we just talked about how M can at most be N squared, right? Because in a, in a graph where all the edges are there, all possible edges. Cool. All right. I hope you guys are comfortable with that because now we're going to talk about depth first search. So the question that we're trying to solve is, given a graph, I want to explore the graph. I want to understand its structure, OK? That's what all of these search algorithms are doing, is they just want to visit every single node in the graph. They want to explore it. So one way to think about depth first search is essentially how you might explore a, a labyrinth, OK? You start at a certain position, 
And what you do with that first search is you figure out who is next to me, who are all my neighbors, where can I go next? Let me pick one of them and go there. And then you repeat that. You say like, well, now I'm here. Who is my neighbor? Who's next to me that I have not been to before? Let me go there next, okay? So for example, I guess the way you wanna think about it in your head is you're exploring the labyrinth, right? So this is like a, a puzzle or like a maze that you're in. And what you can do is you have a piece of chalk that lets you mark where you have been before so that you never, cause you don't wanna end up kind of in a circle and just going over and over, right? And you also have a piece of string that ties you back to where you were coming from, okay? So you're able to mark things as like, I've already been here and you have a string that keeps you back. And that's what we're gonna do. So all of these nodes are marked as like not there yet. Like I've never been there, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our chalk to mark them as I've been there, but I have not explored everything out yet. So like I got here and there were like three ways I could leave, but I have not finished going through all three ways, right? But we're gonna color it as I was already here. I just haven't finished, okay? And then we're gonna have another color or another marking that is gonna say, I have been here and I've explored all possible ways to leave this place, okay? So basically it's like, I'm done. I'm done with this note. It's like I went everywhere I could take it. Uh, here's the example. So we're at the start. The very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna mark it. I was here, but I have not finished exploring, right? Then we're gonna pick one path and we're just gonna go down it. So let's say we pick this one. It actually doesn't matter which one you pick. We pick this one and now we mark this node as, oh, I've been here, but I have not finished exploring all the ways out. Okay. Can you guys imagine how this might be a recursive algorithm? All right, keep that in the back of your head as we walk through the example, because we do have, essentially anytime you're repeating the same thing, you should think, oh, maybe this is recursive. And we start here and what we did is we looked at all the neighbors, found one we hadn't been to before and went there. And now we're here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all its neighbors. We're gonna skip this one because we've already been there and we're gonna pick one to go to, right? So let's say this one. So now I've been here, I mark it as yellow and I do the same thing again now. I look at all my neighbors except the ones I've already been to. And I say, let me go to one of them, all right? So let's go here. And then I repeat the same thing. I look at all my neighbors, there's three of them. I already, I've already been to this one and I know because I marked it, right? So now from these two, let's just go to one of them. Now I'm here. And then I repeat again. I look at my neighbors, I've already been here, so I won't go there. So now I follow this one. This is the only, this is the only edge I have not traversed, right? But if you look here, both of your neighbors, you've actually already been to, right? So we actually mark this one as, I've been there and I've been to all its neighbors sometime in the past, okay? So now, so now we're basically, we're like, I'm done with this node. There's nowhere to go. So I'm gonna backtrack. I'm gonna go one step back. I'm gonna follow my string, right? Cause my string is here. You know, we laid it out, it's pretty long. We got to the end and we're gonna say, well, I'm gonna go back one. Cause I ran out of places to go, okay? So we go back one. And then here we say, well, this one, I already finished exploring. This one I've already been to before. So this is the only empty one I haven't been to yet, ever. So I'm gonna go there, right? And then we repeat again. So where, where do I go from here? Which node am I gonna go to, if any? What, what's gonna happen to this one? Yeah? It's gonna go back because it's gonna look at the two nodes it can go to, and it's gonna say, oh, I've actually already been to those two, right? So it's actually gonna retrace, it's gonna go back to the bottom one. It's gonna, well, first of all, it's gonna mark it as I've been here and I've been to all the neighbors, and then it's gonna go back, right? And then here, we've been to all the neighbors as well. So we're gonna mark it, oh, I've actually been everywhere. 
So I'm going to go back, right? And then here, we're going to look here. We're going to say, wait, actually, I've been everywhere as well. <laughs> so I'm going to go back again, all right? And then finally here, it'll be like, oh, I've been everywhere as well. So I'm going to go back again. And here is where you finally get to like, oh, I haven't been to this one yet. So I should go check that out and see what happens, right? So then you go there. And then from here, you're like, oh, I've been everywhere. I can't go anywhere anymore. So I'm going to go back to the beginning, right? That is step first search. It's you walking on a labyrinth with a string going as far as deep as you can go, just picking edges that you have not been to before. So every time you get somewhere, you say like, I stepped foot here. And then you go to some place you have not stepped foot on, right? And then eventually you'll get to a point where you're gonna be in a place where no matter where you're gonna go, you have already been there. So you'll be like, oh, this is done. So I need to backtrack. I need to go follow my string back to where I came from, okay? And then you keep repeating this process. That is, that is it, that is that first search. That is exactly what it does. And I guess you guys can probably guess the name. It goes deep, okay? Like it goes as deep as possible, backtracks one step, goes as deep as possible, backtracks one step, goes as deep as possible, okay? So hopefully you guys are thinking, how might you write this in code? given that we have an adjacency list representation of the graphs. <laughs> so if we were going to write this in pseudocode, you would imagine that every vertex needs to keep track of a couple of things. It was either unvisited, right? I've never been to it before. It was in progress, AKA I was here, but I didn't finish going everywhere I wanted to go. Or it was all done. These are the three colors we used, right? So in our code, we're gonna add extra information to each of our nodes so that it keeps track of what state the node is at. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. Now, I am also going to keep track of additional information, which is going to come in handy for future algorithms, but I'll just let you guys know. It will also keep track of the first time we go into it, okay? So basically, and it'll keep track of when we mark it as all done. So it's going to say, the first time I visit an unvisited node, it's going to mark it as time t. And every time I move between nodes, it's gonna increase the time by one. And then when it's all done, it's gonna say, this is the finish time. So for every node, you're gonna have a number that tells you when you, when you went in, and you're gonna have a number that tells you when you finished it completely, okay? This is gonna be helpful for other algorithms, right? There are other ways to implement DFS that do not keep track of this. But for this class is the way we're going to implement it, okay? Here is the pseudocode. Who wants to walk me through it? W is the vertex that I am currently in, okay? So we're going to write a function called DFS that is going to have access to some graph, okay? And as input, it's gonna take in a W, which is the vertex um, I want to go visit. And it's gonna take in the current time. So just an integer that tells you what is the time right now, okay? Uh, who wants to walk me through the steps that you would follow here? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so just to summarize, right? We set the current, the start time of the node to our current time. So this is gonna be zero to start with, but whatever, when we get to the node for the first time, we're gonna say, I got to you at this time, right? 
Then we're going to increment the current time by one, because now we need to go to the next tick of the clock, let's say. We're going to mark W as like, you are in progress. I have started where I visited you. I have started working on you. And then we're going to do what we said. We're going to look at every neighbor of W, right? And then if I have not been to that neighbor before, so if that node is marked as unvisited, right? Then I'm going to go visit it. And how do I visit? I call myself DFS on V, and then I give it the current time, right? That will take care of visiting that node, right? So again, this is where recursion helps you a lot because you're like, this will take care of visiting everything that has to do with node V. By the time that's done, V will be complete, right? So I increment my current time by one, again, because we're complete. I set the finish time to W because now I am done with W to the current time. And then mark W is all done because I, for every neighbor, I explored everything there was to explore, right? So here's the example. So we start with current time at zero. W is going to be our A. This is our starting point, our starting node. We're going to set the current time to one, and we're going to mark start of A at zero. So you started at zero time. Then for each neighbor, if you're unvisited, right? So let's say C, I'm going to go visit you. So go visit you just means I'm going to call myself on W, OK? Oh, sorry, on V, on this neighbor V, which is now C, right? And then this will do a bunch of stuff. It'll go visit every other node as well, right? It'll set the start time to 1. Then it'll go visit a bunch of nodes. Let's say it takes it 20 steps to finish visiting everything else that was here. Eventually, it'll come back and say, I finished in time 20. And it gets back to this line. So then C gets completed, right? So this that's all happening with this recursive call. It is doing all the work for us, right? It is taking care of visiting every other neighbor that exists at W, all right? So then we set, we go back to A and we set it's, well, we've, I guess this is one iteration of the loop. We visited all of C. So in the next iteration, D is still a neighbor we haven't visited, right? So we call DFS on D, but, but D has no other neighbor, so it'll very quickly finish, right? Does that make sense? So like, we'll go visit this one and it'll come back here. That is very close to what you would write in Python to implement this code. And it is not that different to what you would write in C++. Yeah. It is going to come in handy for something that we call topological sorting of the graph. Um, that's the only reason we keep track of it. You do not have to. You can actually get rid of current time, and this will explore the whole graph, just like we talked about. But sometimes you want to add extra information to your nodes because that helps you answer questions about the graph. Yeah. Yeah. What start? Yeah. So this one would have the biggest gap between its start and its end. Yes. Because it has to visit everything. And then everything else actually has a smaller gap, which is actually a good thing to notice because we are going to use that information to do topological sorting, which is a way to determine how you can visit nodes without ever having to go back. But we'll, we'll get to that. Cool. Again, just to re-emphasize, this is not the only way to write that first search. You will see many implement. This is a recursive implementation, which stores the time we went in and the time we finished, and it stores the color for the nodes. There are. Another very interesting implementation is one that is not recursive, where you use a stack to keep track of where you want to go. OK, so I encourage you guys to think of that and be like, hey, how might I write this algorithm not using recursion, but instead using a loop, like a while loop, and using a stack? Because if you remember a stack, um, you push things in, and then the last thing you pushed in is the first thing you pop out. Okay, 
So that helps you kind of like make your string, right? So every time you, you go to a node, you like push its neighbors. Then you go to a node, push its neighbors. And then when you start popping them out, you're going to pop them out in reverse order, OK? So that's why a stack can also be used to write the same algorithm, all right? But we're going to use the recursion, recursive version because I like it better. And I think it's a lot easier to understand than the stack. But I don't know. What do you guys think? The stack is not too hard, actually. But it, it just kind of depends on what you like, I would say. And I really like recursion. So, and the reason I like recursion is because I can say, like, oh, when I call this, it like does everything for me. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about this. Uh, it's not so pretty. Yeah. W here in C, it would be a struct. So this might be. Um, yeah, this is a good time. I'll take the next four minutes to show you guys what this might actually look like in code in C. So. I think, let me dig up the link. Uh, wait, I had it, I had it somewhere, right? Oh, okay. So if you go to this replet, this is, this defines a graph. So uh, I guess let me zoom in a little bit. This is a class in C++ that corresponds to a node. So I made it a class so I could have extra information in it. So it's not just the number. It's not just the float. It is a class that is going to take in some value. So these are going to be the numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. Um, it lets you figure out who your neighbors are, like the out neighbors and the in neighbors. So it returns a vector of who your neighbors are. And those neighbors are also nodes, right? And uh, it also keeps track of the in and the out time, in and out. And it keeps track of the state of the vertex, which is this enum, which corresponds to unvisited, in progress, or done, right? So this is what the W is in the algorithm. So this is a graph. So the W is one of these objects, this comp 285 vertex, OK? And you can actually see that because the algorithm is here. Let's look at search.h. DFS, it takes in a graph, which I, I didn't tell you what it was, but it takes in a graph. And it also takes in a W, which is where I want to start my search, OK? And if you look at the implementation, it is actually exactly the pseudocode that we just talked about, right? So it says w in time equals current time. So the start time is current time. It says, I'm going to set the state of w to in progress. And then for w, get my out neighbors. So this is directed instead of undirected. But for every out neighbor, look at v. If the state of v is unvisited, right, then call yourself recursively, right? get the time, increment the time. And then once you're done visiting all the neighbors, then you're done with W. So you set the out time, current time. You set the state to done. And then that's it. You return the current time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So graph.h, so th this is actually, this is the entirety of comp 285 vertex. Uh, and then the other one you might be interested in is comp 285 graph. So all a graph does is it stores all the vertices, and that's it. Because the vertexes themselves know who they're connected to. So yeah, it's the adjacency list. So it literally stores them using a vector of uh, vertices that are basically pointers to our vertex. Okay? Um, and you can, you can look at graph CPP as well. So this is where. You know, like, do I have an out neighbor? Do I have an in neighbor? And it's actually not that complicated. It's a lot of like code in C++ because you're dealing with classes and like whatever, but the logic itself is just like, you know, 
get the in neighbors is just like, oh, just return like the vector of in neighbors that you have. And every time I add an edge, so I guess the tricky part would be like, um, where is add? A, yeah, like every, but it's not that tricky, I guess. Like every time I add an out neighbor to a certain vertex, I just look at its out neighbors and I put it into the list, you know? And then, and then that's how I keep track of all of them. So this, this is the, yeah, and that's it. Like you guys should like, like if you can get to the pseudocode, you are like 80% of the way to the actual code. Because after that, it's just literally, you have to think like, how do I do a for loop in C++ to go over my vertices? How do I have something in the language that lets me keep track of multiple things, right? Which would be a class, it would be an object. You need an object, right? Um, yeah, and you're, and this code does work. So we have, uh, yeah, so I guess like class is over, but there are a couple of examples that we're gonna cover, I guess, next lecture. Um, you can actually run this code. Please don't fail me, but I'm pretty sure I tested it. And it essentially, we create a graph with a bunch of dependencies, and then we use DFS to figure out what's the first thing we should install. So we're gonna cover that next lecture so you guys don't have to worry about it. But I do encourage you, like, look at the pseudocode and then look at this code to see, like, how you might write it. I'll say the Python version of the pseudocode is a lot more direct as to how you write it. Um, but yeah, cool. Uh-huh. No, no. So if you ever get a question in your interview that it's about graphs, usually, actually what they will do is they will tell you, assume I have a graph class that has the methods, get me all my neighbors. And then they'll be like, assume that exists. And then you use that in your code. So basically what they will be looking for is they'll, they'll be looking for this code mostly. And then they'll tell you, you know, this function, like it, it exists and, and it does, it does this thing. And now you just need to use it. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks everyone on zoom. See you guys.